Well, we're back on our eschatology study. Basically, I'm just giving you a review uh, of what eschatology is. Now, does everyone have a handout? Does anyone not get a handout? Raise your hand if you don't have a handout right here, please. John Michael, you got an extra? We got an extra. You got an extra one up there, John Michael? Down there? Over there? Never mind. We're, we're good. We're covered. We're covered. Okay, so everybody has one now. Okay, very good. Eschatology simply means? The study of the end times. And when did the end times begin, beloved? <laughs> Before the foundation of the world? I think a little after that, though. When do you think the end times began? This, it's up for debate. There's a number of opinions. When what? Jesus ascended. When Jesus resurrected in ascension. Yeah, some believe that. It certainly could be true that it was when Jesus ascended. I think with the coming of the Christ, it began the end times, didn't it? Because there were so many prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah, right? I, I think kind of when Adam and Eve sinned. When, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it began and started pretty short, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about Pentecost? Yeah, Pentecost with the birth of the church. That could certainly be a time frame that we would look at. You know, when I consider all that the Bible has to say with regard to end times and the prophetic word, uh, certainly when Israel became a nation among the nations once again, wow, then we knew we're, we're very close. And Jesus himself gives that prophecy concerning the rebirth of the nation. He said, when you see the leaves of the fig tree turn green, no, you know that summer's near because that happens every year. But he wasn't talking about the fig tree, was he? No, he's talking about Israel. And when Israel is reborn, when life comes back into that tree, the tree of Israel, then you know that the generation that sees this will see the end of the age. Wow. So some believe it was 48, but some believe it was 67, because in 1948, they did not have the control of the Temple Mount. Or they did not have control of all of the landmass that Israel had when Jesus made that prophecy. I would agree with the 67 date more than I would the 48 date. But nonetheless, one generation, what is a generation biblically? How many? 52 point, how do you figure that, John? Genealogy of That's right, the genealogy in Matthew. There's three sets of 14 generations. And if you go from when Abraham was born to the Christ, that's a certain number of years, if my memory is correct, 2,160 years. And then you divide that by the 42 generations, and that's where you come up with a figure of approximately uh, 52. Point two years, or approximately 50 years. So if a biblical generation is 50 years and we go to 1967, where are we? Overdue. We're overdue. <laughs> <laughs> and according to my clock, he's over two, two. He's over, but he's never going to be late, is he? No. It's going to be exactly on time, won't it? But, but beloved, we are not as those who are in the dark. Paul would write that to the church at Thessalonica. He shared with them so many of the end times prophecies concerning the coming of the Christ. So much of what he shared with them was eschatological. When you read First and Second Thessalonians, you're amazed. And he spent a very short time there. How long did he spend there? Three weeks. Three weeks. That's all the time. And, and, and he took them so deep in his, their understanding of the word. They must have had all day and all night Bible studies. But nonetheless, he told them that, that he's coming as a thief in the night for those who are unaware. But that's not you, beloved. You are not in the night, but in the day. That that day should not overtake you as a thief in the night. And so that is true. Although it's going to take the sleeping church and the unbelieving world as a thief in the night... It's not going to take us unaware, is it? We know, we know very clearly from the prophetic word as we study eschatology and everything the Bible has to say about end times that we are very, very close. Out of how many verses in the New Testament does it speak of the second coming? A lot. A lot. Every what? One in ten. One in ten verses in the New Testament speak of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? A major subject. And so we should know something about it. Now, we discussed this uh, a few weeks ago. I don't know how many weeks ago it was, maybe a month ago, right? Well, look at this first, the first page where it says eschatology. It says it's uh, from the Greek eschatos, and I gave you the, uh, the Strong's word there. It means the last things, but why do we study eschatology? One, it's a major part of the biblical narrative, both Old Testament and New Testament. How many of the Old Testament prophets? 
spoke well out into the end of time. Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Amos, so many. Uh, we preach and heed the whole counsel of God. It's important that we teach eschatology, end times, and Israelology. Unfortunately, in the contemporary church today, there are many young pastors who want nothing to do with the Old Testament, nothing to do with Bible prophecy or Israelology, and they, all they want to do is focus on the Christology in the New Testament. Well, it's to the detriment of the, of the maturity of their congregation of growing them strong in the Word of God. But we want to cover the whole counsel of God, don't we? And everyone seems to be interested in what the future holds, aren't you? Yeah, isn't it very concerning what's taking place in our day today? Yes. You know, I, I mean, we know where we're going to end up, right? But it's really concerning what we see taking place, particularly the, the destruction of our own society. There's a war on Christianity that's taking place. Don't think that this is a war on pro-life alone. No, this is a war on Christianity that we're seeing take place, much like in Noah's day. And Jesus said, by the way, the Son of Man will return at a time when it's as in the days of Noah. And that's exactly what we're seeing take place right now. There's such a rebellion and a hatred for God and everything that is godly and holy. But not only that, we look at the geopolitical situation in the world, and isn't it very concerning about what's happening in Europe? This administration is leading us into a war. We're already in the war. We just haven't put boots on the ground where we're actually shooting Russians, but we're giving the Ukrainians all the armament they need to go ahead and be as successful as they have been in this struggle with the Russians. And what is this man going to do? We already know he, he murders his political enemies. Desperate men, make no mistake about that. Desperate men do desperate things, and he is becoming more and more desperate as each day goes by. And so it is very concerning what God may allow this man to do. He has more tactical nuclear weapons than any other nation on the face of the earth. You know that, don't you? Yeah, and some of the more uh, astute foreign policy experts in our country and overseas believe that he's going to use those. Boy, that's a, that would be a game changer, wouldn't it? Does the Bible say anything about nuclear weapons being used in the, in the last days? Yep. Well, it certainly does. It surely does. Yeah. Zechariah describes what takes place to the enemies of Israel when God judges them for coming against all of Jerusalem. And what happens? Their, eyes. their eyeballs melt in their eye sockets, their tongue in their mouth, and their flesh comes off of their bones before their bones even hit the ground. Now, there's no way Zechariah could have ever conceived of anything like that. Ezekiel describes the same thing basically in chapter 39 of Ezekiel, a limited nuclear conflict, and that would be horrific, wouldn't it? Hmm. But I believe we're going to approach that day, and I believe that day may be sooner than we think. A lot of people want to know, is what's happening in Europe a precursor to what uh, end times prophecy, fulfilling end times prophecy? And I think it is. But we are, we are living at a very exciting period of time, beloved, as believers. If you're a believer and you're a saint, you're a lover of Jesus Christ, a lover of God's word, you know that this is probably a more exciting time to be alive than when, when Jesus actually walked along the shore of the Galilee. Why? Very few people could enter into what was taking place then, the joy of that time. But now, through the person of the Holy Spirit, we can all, the whole body of Christ can be aware. And so much of the body of Christ worldwide is completely aware of what's happening right now. We're straining to hear the bridegroom's voice, right? The, the, the bridegroom coming, the bridegroom coming. Yeah, but I believe most of the church, the body of Christ, recognizes that that's the call that the Holy Spirit is placing within our hearts right now, that the bridegroom is coming. Amen? Amen. Yeah, people want to know what the future holds. Eschatology is a motivation for believers. It, it really does motivate us to share the truth of God's Word. One thing we should all be about right now, if we're really in the time frame that I've been talking about, that I believe we're in, and we need to do everything we can to share the truth of God's Word with everyone that we know, anyone who would give us an ear, we need to share the truth of God's Word. And so this Friday and Saturday morning, we'll give you a training so that you'll be very confident in sharing the truth very succinctly, very quickly, very effectively. You know, you don't want to get into these long conversations where you start to have arguments 
that generate more heat than light, right? So you want to bring a person to where they come to the light of the truth quickly, and surely the way the master does that. So I want to encourage every one of you to sign up for that. Well, I guess there is not a sign-up, is there, John Michael? You just show up. Okay, so there is a sign up on Realm? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so either send John Michael an email or sign up on Realm, but I want to encourage every one of you to sign up this Friday night and this Saturday, Friday from 6 to 9 approximately, is that right? Yeah. And then Saturday morning from 9 to noon-ish? Yep. Okay, very good. So it is imperative that we be about what Jesus commanded us to do. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And what did he tell us to do? Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Well, it takes some bit of time to make a disciple, but first you have to make them a believer. You have to take a, saint, a sinner and turn him into a saint, right? Well, only God can do that, but it's amazing how he used our witness to accomplish his will, that work of salvation. Hmm? Eschatology is a purifying effect upon the believer, right? First John says, all those who have this hope purify themselves just as he is pure. What does he mean by that? Well, you, you want to make sure that you're not caught doing things you shouldn't be doing when the Lord returns. You know, Gail goes out of the house, and I am so tempted to go to the freezer, and you know. <laughs> but boy, if she comes home and she sees me with that carton, and oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I say that in jest, but you know, there's, there's a world of things that we don't ever, 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 we want to make sure that when he returns, we will be found serving our king faithful, where the response will only be, I simply did what you, you requested me or commanded me to do. We can at least do that much, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, it says eschatology gives perspective to the troubles and the trials of this age. What's that perspective? What kind of a perspective do you get when you consider the time that we're in, when you consider what the Bible has to say with regard to the fulfillment or the consummation of the age? Time is a precious commodity. Some what? Time is a precious commodity. Time's precious. Oh, boy, is time precious. You know, it is the most com precious commodity we have because you, you can never get anything back, can you? No. No. What else? What other perspective does it put on? God's, God's sovereignty is our sanity, right? God is sovereign, and by his permissive will or his active will, everything takes place. And so we can take great comfort in that. Don't get discouraged. You know Don't, listen, when we experience suffering and trials and testings, it should perfect and mature our faith. We should not be discouraged. No. How do we look at suffering, the trials that God brings into our life? How should we look at them? Is if God asking us to? Yeah. Can I trust you in this suffering, God says? Can I trust you won't run? Can I trust you won't abandon me? Mm. We don't want to forsake him, do we? We have the Holy Spirit. And so we can handle any, any trial, any suffering, any testing that comes into our life in, in a very biblical and a very godly way, not the way the world looks at it. Peace give I unto thee. Peace that surpasses all understanding in every circumstance. Why? Because he is faithful. Why? Because we know eternally we're going home. Hmm? We're going to the home place, as I mentioned on Sunday, right? Eschatology warns the unbeliever of coming judgment. And listen, if you're not, as I, I don't know how I, I could have been any stronger in my message on Sunday in warning you that you need warn those whom you know who are, paying, who are playing fast and loose with their faith, who are compromised, who are characterized living in a sinful lifestyle. They are condemned. No mistake, the, the word is, it doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter what they think, doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. What does the word of God say? And why did the Holy Spirit come? What does he convict of? Sin. Sin. Righteousness. 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 And the judgment to come. We, we are all sinners. We have all fallen short. But we recognize the righteousness of Christ and we turn our life back to him and he restores us, he forgives us, he renews us, 
And if we don't do that, if we don't submit to the Lord, if we don't repent, if we don't turn unto him, there's a judgment coming. Make no mistake about that. Very few talk about that today, don't they? That's why there's so many, so many who are called by his name who can continually live a lifestyle of sin and there's no conviction. Why? Because there's too many people not telling them the truth, accommodating them in their compromise and in their appeasement. That's the worst, listen, that's the worst thing. I don't want anybody to face me on a day of judgment and say, why didn't you tell me? You knew, why didn't you tell me? But it would be horrible, wouldn't it? Hmm. And we talked about hermeneutics. Herman the Newtonic, you know, hermeneutics is a, just simply the method by which you study the Bible, the principles that you use. Hermeneutics, the study method that deals with interpretation, especially of the biblical text, establishment of the principles by which it is interpreted, all right? But we said within everybody's hermeneutic, they have a bias. There are two major bias, right, when you approach the scriptures. And what are those bias? dispensational, right? Which is simply dispensational theology. You're allowing the text to speak for itself, right? You're, you're allowing the truth to come out of the text, right? What do we call that in theological terms? Exegesis. Exegesis. Allowing the, the scriptures to speak forth. Allowing the text to speak for itself. Allowing the truth to come out of the text. Dispensational theology is one. I think you have that in your notes. Uh, biblical exegesis leads out of the text. It is an actual interpretation of the text, bringing out its literal meaning. Inductive Bible study method is what we use. It follows as observation, interpretation, application. That's what you do when you do an exegetical study of the Word. Now, when we do an exe exegetical study of the Word, we know that God has two redemptive plans, two distinct people of God. Who are they? Yes, the Jew, Israel, and the church. The Jews promised the kingdom of God on earth. All Israel will be saved. Israel will be the supreme nation among the nations of the world one day, the kingdom of God on earth. But to the church, the promises are exclusive, distinctive, right? The promise to the church is the kingdom of heaven, heaven. Church has promised the spiritual kingdom. Israel's promised an earthly kingdom. But make no mistake, when you really study the scriptures in an exegetical fashion, you'll come away with a strong understanding of God's preeminence with Israel. Two major subjects of the scriptures. One is Jesus and the redemption that comes only through Christ. And then the second major subject is Israel, God's people. You can't get away from that. Then there's the covenant theology that people use, not dispensational, but covenant theology, emphasizing the, the covenants to almost to uh, an erroneous position, although I believe that dispensational covenant theology actually blend, they parallel. But in covenant theology, what is the term that we use for the way in which they interpret the scripture? Allegorical, allegorical it's eisegesis. They don't see it literally, they see it allegorically. So they're leading into the, they're putting into the text what they want to see. They come to the text with already predetermined position, all right? And so they want to see that in the text. And so that's what they're looking for, and that's what they bring about. You've got to be very creative. They lead into the text. It is the reading into the text, what you believe it to say allegorically. Allegorical method is as follows, imagination, exploration, application. <laughs> You, you have a predetermined position that you take in your imagination, and then now you're looking for scriptures to support that. That's, that's the, the fallacy with topical preaching. A preacher will pick a topic that he wants to speak on and then look for verses to support what he wants to share. doesn't keep those verses in their context, because when you interpret the scripture, what is king? Context. context. Understand the verses before, the verses after, chapter before, chapters after, and you'll come away with an accurate interpretation of what God is saying. Call it well preaching. I'm sorry? Well preaching. Well preaching. Oh, and they don't do well, do they? No, no. no. Uh, when we talk about covenant theology, what are some of the covenants that are emphasized? And the covenants are in the scriptures, but I think if you study, and we'll go through that in weeks to come, when you study 
the, the, you'll see a parallel between covenant theology and dispensational theology, that God works in various dispensations of time, and he works in association with the covenants he's established. What was the first covenant? The Edenic. What was the Edenic covenant? In the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve, right? Here's the rule. Here's the rule of all the trees of the garden. Manja. Enjoy. But one. You know, you think we could keep one, don't you think? <laughs> don't you think we could keep? No, we can't. We can't even keep one rule, can we? No. What's the next one? The Adamic. Adam. What was that covenant with Adam? The covenant of redemption that would come, right? And then the next one was the Noetic. Noetic, never again, never again will I what? Never again will I flush the place. I'll burn it, but I'm not going to flush it. <laughs> and then you had the Abrahamic covenant, which is a, a restored people back to God through Abraham. You had the Mosaic covenant, which is the revealing of the law and the righteousness, the holiness of God. The Palestinian covenant, a return unto the land, the promise of the land. The Davidic covenant... Ah, that one of the, th of the descendants of David would be upon the throne of God forever and ever and ever and ever. And we know who that was speaking of. Jesus was of the descendancy of David by whom? Both. By his stepfather, Joseph, and by his mother, Mary, right? Of the Davidic line. And lastly, there was the... Lastly, there was the new covenant. The new covenant. Most important to us, right? That, that was the covenant of redemption. That was the covenant of resurrection. You, you can't experience that redemption without experiencing the resurrection. Uh, resurrection Sunday, we talked about that at length, right? What resurrection are we talking about? The resurrection of the spirit of the individual believer. There are two resurrections every believer will experience. You can't have one without the other, though. You have to have the first, the resurrection of your spirit, which was dead to God. You're, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. In Adam, all died. But in Christ, all are made alive. But God, even though you, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God has made us alive, that God has resurrected our spirit. That was dead to God, right? And so therefore, because you have a resurrected spirit, and you, because you have a resurrected spirit, you will live in the newness of life, right? You'll live a new life. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As I have shared countless times, let me share it again. You listen with your, listen with your, your ears will deceive you. Your eyes never will. You watch, study a person's life. And you'll know what they believe. Hmm? Yeah. There are a lot of people who have a profession, but not a possession. Their lips draw near unto him, Jesus said, but their lives are far from me. Far from me. They don't know the Lord. Don't you doubt the Lord? And so that, that's very important. When you have a resurrected spirit, you can't help but desire the pursuit of holiness, of righteousness. You, you want your life to change. Uh, my, my wife will bear testimony. We pray all the time, Lord, change me. Change me from the core of my being. Continue to change me, Lord. I need change. Do you? But it's the Holy Spirit in you, in that resurrected spirit that cries out for that change, you see. Yeah, we want to be in right relationship with God once again. And therefore, you know, if you've experienced that, that first resurrection in the new covenant, through Jesus Christ our Lord, then you will experience a resurrection one day to eternal life of the body. Isn't that wonderful? Any questions on that? You got your hand out? Any questions? Any comments? Now, the first covenant was the covenant in the garden, Edenic, in Eden. Eden. Yeah. Yeah. Adamic? Adamic no. No. E D E N I C. Edenic. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on the subject that is mentioned here uh, that is most uh, 
prominent in these first few verses, first six verses actually, of Revelation 20. <clears throat> and I'm going to leave some time at the end where I want to show you a couple of videos from The Way of the Master. And once again, I'm going to plug the class. And if you, if you are planning on joining me in going to Honduras in October, it is going to be required that you take this class. Okay? We want you to take the class. And we'll do it again. If you can't make it this weekend, you'll make it after that. But it's important that you have a, an ability, that you have the tools to be able to communicate the gospel. Do you know it's only a single digit percentage of Christians who share their faith? Because they, they just don't feel confident. You know. 2%? Can you imagine that? That's the same ones that tithe. The, the same number that tithe? <laughs> you mean there's only 2% that are real? Hmm. <laughs> Chapter 20, Revelation. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain was in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was a devil, and he bound him. And, and he bound him for what? How long is a thousand years? You sure? How long is a thousand years? A thousand years. <laughs> this is literal. And he cast him into the pit. pit. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set his seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations no more till the end of what? How many? We're finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon him, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been headed for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast nor his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and they reigned with Christ for? How long? Okay. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, how many times does it say a thousand years? At least three? <laughs> I think a little more than three. I think it was six times. I think it's six. Is it six? Yeah, it's six times. Six times it's mentioned, and when we do an exegetical study and take the scripture literally, what is he meaning? And what's going to happen for a thousand years? Everything we just read. Christ will reign on earth. Christ is actually coming back. He's going to step foot on planet earth. He's going to establish the kingdom of God on earth for Israel. And he's going to reign here for a thousand years. Of which the church, listen, this is a thousand years of peace. Why? Because Satan is bound. Can you imagine that? A thousand years of love and peace and joy and purpose of which the church has been arguing about for 2,000 years. Why? Because there are many who don't believe that. They deny this. What do we call this, period? Millennialism. Millennialism. And how many positions are there? Basically, now they're, they're, you, can, you can dissect it, you can peel this onion more than you could possibly imagine, but how many basic positions are there on a millennial, a millennialism? Four. Four. How do you know that? You got it in front of you, right? You got it in your sheet. Turn your sheet over. There's four. And so that's what we're going to look at this evening, these four basic positions and, and, and how they perceive the eschatological or end times scriptures, and particularly this reign of Jesus Christ, which is what we're all waiting for. That's the culmination of the age. When the church age will be over and Christ establishes his kingdom and reigns upon the earth for a thousand years, and at the end of the thousand years... He brings in a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness will reign forever. Forever. How long is forever, David? You talked a lot about that last week, didn't you? That forever and ever and ever. Okay. Well, the first one we're going to look at is all millennialism. And when you consider the hermeneutic for an all millennialist, they're idealistic. It's eisegesis, not exegesis. So they're reading into the text. They're not allowing the text to speak for itself. 
The all-millennial position believes that there is no millennial reign. No, no literal thousand-year reign uh, that spiritually Christ is reigning now and he began to reign ever since his resurrection. Christ is victorious over Satan and is reigning all over the whole world. And in every day and in every way, things are getting better and better and better. Isn't that true? No. Of course not. Bless you. But, but they take and they, they, they allegorize the text to believe that the book of the Revelation and all that has taken place in the Revelation has already happened. It happened during the Roman Empire, and that's all that the Bible is writing about in an allegorical sense. Nothing could be farther from the truth, right? So we don't embrace that. And it's understanding of the kingdom here is a spiritual reality in which all Christians partake by faith. You're in the kingdom right now. You're in the thousand-year reign of Christ now. Wait a minute, how can that be? He's been gone for how long? 2,000, 2000 years, right? Something's wrong with that. And then with regard to the rapture, what's their position on that? Well, that the saints living and dead will meet the Lord in the clouds. He will immediately judge the nations and the saints will follow him into the eternal kingdom. It all happens so simultaneously. Doesn't seem to be clear divisions as it's laid out in the scripture. The scripture clearly tells us that God will come and he'll bind Satan for how long? And at the end of the thousand years, then he'll judge him and judge the, those who are in rebellion to him, right? And now, when we talk about the first resurrection and the second resurrection, what do we understand about that? I tried to clear that up with you last time we talked about eschatology. What do, what do we understand about the first resurrection? When they talk about the first resurrection, what are they referring to? Is, the, is that first resurrection one moment in time? No, it's over a It's over a period of time. The disciples could say, we participated in that last Passover with our Savior. And John could say, I, I participated in that last Passover with my Savior on that Monday. I clearly remember. And Andrew would say, no, 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 I remember. I participated in that last Seder with our Savior, and it was Tuesday. And Peter would say, no, 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 nay, nay, nay. I participated. I can remember that glorious last Seder, that last Passover. Not the Seder specifically, but the Passover. It was a Wednesday. Why could they all be true? Because that last Passover was a seven-day seven period, right? So it could be anywhere in that seven days that they said, we, we celebrate that last Passover, right? Now, when they speak of the first resurrection, it's the resurrection of the believers. It's, it's the resurrection of the believers at the rapture of the church, right? Who are resurrected, the dead first, and then we who are alive and remain. Mm -hmm. But there's also the resurrection of those who came to faith during the tribulation period, or maybe they went into the tribulation. I, I'm not sure. I, you know, I can believe either way. But nonetheless, at the end of the tribulation period, they were raised to the new. So that was that first resurrection. What's the last resurrection? The second resurrection? The resurrection of the dead to be judged at the great white throne judgment. That's the second resurrection. So the first resurrection is it, it, not any one moment in time, but it's the process by which God is resurrecting all believing saints, okay? At the rapture, living and, and, and dead, okay? And then after the tribulation period, it'll be those who, who have perished during the tribulation period, they'll be resurrected. So blessed are those who participate in that first resurrection. Cursed are those who participate in the second resurrection. The second resurrection is to be resurrected to damnation. When an unbeliever dies, where do they go now? Hades. 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 Sheol, mankind's common grave. They don't go to hell yet. No. Uh -huh. no. Hell is Gahana, right? The place of the eternal da eternally damned. Now, they're being held there in Hades, in Sheol, until the great white throne judgment. And then all unbelievers will be cast into the lake of fire to be damned for an eternity. Whew. Pretty serious matter, isn't it? So, uh, with regard to Israel, the all-millennials believe that the church is the eschatological fulfillment of Israel, right? Nothing could be farther from the truth. You don't believe that, do you? Do you believe that we've replaced Israel? No. You know, isn't it, in, isn't it convenient for them who believe in replacement theology or that the church has somehow replaced Israel, that they take all the promises and none of the cursings? Yeah. All the blessings but none of the cursings? <laughs> hmm? Post-millennialism, in a uh, hermeneutical sense, they'd be preterists. Uh, their, their method by which they'd interpret the scripture is, again, eisegesis, eisegetical. 
It's the golden age characterized by an unprecedented spread of the gospel, bringing about a Christianization of the world, leading to the second coming and Christ's rule upon the earth. Wow, is that what we see happening? No, no, no. no. What, what do we see happening today in our nation? Well, unbelievable. I, wouldn't, I didn't believe I'd see so much of this in my lifetime, this hatred towards Christ and his church that exists in the United States. Look at the number of churches that were burned in Canada last summer. And what did the Canadian government do about it? Nothing. Nothing. The lawlessness that's being exhibited right now where all these people are breaking the law and trying to bully the Supreme Court justices is completely against federal law. What are they doing about it? Nothing. Nothing. What have they done about all the criminality, all the lawlessness that, that seems to be taking place in the political arena and it seems to be one party has a monopoly over another? What are they doing about all of that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Lawlessness. So we don't, we don't see the Christianization of the world. The world is becoming more and more anti-Christ, more and more hatred for Christ. Their understanding of the kingdom, they believe in, in dominion theology, kingdom now. I hear anybody ever read anything much about the kingdom now, folks? No? Who was a big proponent of the kingdom now? You know of anybody? Watchman Knee. Nee. Watchman Knee. Nee. Big advocate of kingdom now or dominion theology. And what does dominion theology promote? Look at this here. Dominion of the earth over the seven mountains. The seven, now, if you've been in a hyper-Pentecostal environment, you've heard this term before, the seven mountains. Have you heard this? No? Anybody ever heard this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's true. They'll talk about the seven spheres within the world system that the church will dominate eventually. Here's the seven spheres, right? Religion, right? The re Christianity will be the religion of the world. Everyone will embrace Christ. The family, certainly every family will have a biblical worldview, understanding, and then be governed by the scriptures. Government, government will be that which enforces the law of God. Right? That's what government is supposed to do. All of our laws should simply be that to enforce the Decalogue or the commandments that God has given us, the Ten Commandments. Uh, not just religion, family, government, education, the educational system. Aren't we so glad it's given themselves over to true spirituality, true Christianity? Oh my. It is so bad. It is so bad. It is so bad. I, I tell parents all the time, if you have your kids in government school, either you're going to either going to be corrupted. You're ensuring their corruption. There is no mistake. If your children are in government school, you are ensuring their the corruption of their soul today. And and you need to seriously pray about doing whatever you have to whatever making whatever sacrifice would be necessary to get them out of there. Education. Media. Oh, they all love Jesus too, don't they? Huh? <laughs> I was so blessed. You know, we went to the ball game Sunday night. What a glorious prayer that was prayed by that pastor out on the field before the game. There's so many references to the embrace of Christianity during that game by the announcers. And it was, just, it was, and it was such a, a family-friendly environment. I pray that it lasts... I pray that it lasts. Hmm. Greenville Drive. Really, really. Wonderful, wonderful. But anyway, education, media, business. You know, it used to be, times gone by, that all of the major business leaders, the wealthiest men in the country, were devout Christians. Can you name a few? J.C. Penny? Letourneau? Rockefeller? They supported missionaries and missions organizations and churches all over the world. They recognized that their wealth was given to them and they had a stewardship and a responsibility to God in giving that wealth back for the increase of the kingdom. Is that the way these people feel today? Jeff Bezos? Mark Zuckerberg? No, no. You need to pray for the salvation of Elon Musk. I've been reading and listening to interviews that he's been given, and one of the things he's been in pursuit of since he was a young man is what? Truth. Truth. Yeah. Truth. Yeah. Truth. Yeah. Oh, boy, i got to believe that anyone who really desires to know the truth will come to an understanding of the truth. If you ever watch the uh, interview with him and uh, fellows from the Babylon Bee, what a disgrace. What a sham. 
What a pathetic, weak way they presented. No, there was no gospel that was presented. They, they were in such awe and such reverence and such intimidation by this man who's the richest man in the world. Should you be in awe, intimidated by anybody's wealth? No, no. The only thing that should intimidate us is people who are more righteous and holy than we are. That should be an intimidation, right? So those seven mountains, religion, family, government, education, media, business, the arts, and entertainment, oh boy, mm. we don't need it. The, their attitude or their belief on the rapture is that it's occurring at the same time as the second coming. At the end of the age, saints living and dead go up immediately and then come down. So it's an up and down experience, right? You go up and immediately come back down to reign with him because you meet him in the air. And there you go. Yeah, I saw Levi just practicing <laughs> up and down. <laughs> we're waiting for the uptaker, not the undertaker, right? <laughs> and when we go up, we're going to go up for a while. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, but that's not what they believe. With regard to Israel, they re again, they embrace replacement theology that the church is the fulfillment of Israel. Again, nothing can be farther from the truth. Be why? Because this is uh, eisegesis, not exegesis. They're putting into the text what they wanted to say rather than allowing the text to speak for itself. As you read the scriptures, you cannot help but fall in love with the Jewish people in Israel. You can't. Now, there are a lot of secular Jews. I know the nation of Israel is very secular, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the gift that they have given us in the Savior and the Word of God. We have, as Paul would write, we have a great debt of love that we owe the Jewish people for all that they've imparted to us Gentiles spiritually. The third position is historical premillennialism, and, and the hermeneutic there is uh, the historicity or the historic aspect of it. It is a exegetical study, unlike the first two, which are eisegesis. They're going to allow the text to speak for itself and, and bring out of the text. They believe in a post-tribulation Christ will gather the saints, institute his thousand-year reign after the tribulation. Well, that'd be upsetting, wouldn't it? Hmm? Jesus comes to rescue us after the tribulation? After we're all beat up, distressed, <laughs> pillaged? <laughs> I ho silver. <laughs> You're a little late. <laughs> yeah, so we don't we don't agree with that, that's for certain. The rapture, the position on the rapture, the saints living and dead will meet the Lord in the clouds as he comes to the earth to commence his thousand year reign. So we don't go up and then come back down immediately. We just we just kinda kinda Mingle with him. You know how you, uh, you're supposed to uh, uh, merge as you get on a 385 or 85? There's so many people down here do not know how to merge. Well, we're going to merge with him. As he's coming down, we're just going to merge with him and come down with him, and he's going to reign for a 1,000 years. There's no seven-year period or more where we're experiencing the marriage feast of the Lamb. Hmm? And then the position on Israel, again, uh, because it's a covenant theology, they embrace replacement theology that the church has fulfilled all of the promises with regard to Israel. And lastly is what we believe, dispensational premillennialism. The hermeneutic is a strict uh, literal interpretation. We're literalists, and it's futuristic. We believe that so much of what the Bible has to say with regard to eschatology and times is yet future. Much of it has been fulfilled, but yet much, yet to be fulfilled, you see, and it will be. Make no mistake about it. You know, one of the uh, champions of covenant theology who embraced replacement theology was a Presbyterian theologian by the name of Rulain Botner. And, and he, he, he came out in an interview, and when he was asked about Israel being back into the land, reborn after almost 2,000 years of being dispersed, dispersed among the nations and, and Hebrew being spoken again, you know what he said? Those damn Jews. They really interfere with my theology. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but basically that's, he was cursing them that they're in the land. That is, I mean, he was denying what his own eyes were seeing, what his ears were hearing. Hmm. Amazing, isn't it? How, well, listen, we've got to be very, very careful that we get so wrapped around what we believe that we refuse to be enlightened by further truth. You know, we've we got to be open that if I have a faulty position, I want to know. I want God to show me. I don't want to believe a lie. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. Don't you? And there are many things that I believed early on in my walk that I don't believe any longer. I thought, how in the world did I believe that? <laughs> Probably not for you all, you know? 
But nonetheless, uh, dispensational premillennialism, at the end of the tribulation, Christ will return with his church to institute the thousand-year reign, right? Because we know that the second coming of Christ happens in two phases, right? The first phase, he's coming for the church. The second phase, he returns with the church, okay? But there'll be at least a seven-year period where we're enjoying Christ at the marriage feast of the Lamb while all of God's wrath is being poured out upon this world as Satan is taking control of the globe. We're not here, thank God, right? So the, the second coming of Jesus is in two phases. The first, he comes for his church, the bride. The second time, he comes and returns with the church, okay? Yes, at the end of the tribulation, Christ will return with his church, institute his thousand-year reign. Those who come to faith and survive during the 70th week of Daniel will populate the earth. Who are they predominantly? Jews. During this time, that's when all Israel will be saved, meaning national Israel, not every Jew, okay? But God will fulfill his promise in Zechariah to pour out the spirit of grace, the spirit of supplication upon the Jewish people, and they'll look upon Jesus, whom they have pierced and mourned. They'll recognize he was our Messiah. And so many are coming to faith today, but not to the magnitude they will in this day. When the church age is over, the Holy Spirit of God is done working predominantly among the Gentile world. He will be working predominantly among the Jews. There'll be 144,000 Apostle Pauls running around Israel evangelizing it. Can you imagine such a thing? There'll be those two mighty witnesses of God, like Moses and Elijah. And then there'll be 144,000 that God is using. Boy, you talk about the way of the master. <laughs> And there'll be so many Jews who come to faith during that time. And God is going to seal those 144,000 so they go through the tribulation and they are not harmed at all. And then it'll be those believing Jews who believe during the 70th seven of Daniel. Remember, that's the last seven-year period. The 70th seven of Daniel begins what we call the tribulation period, but the tribulation actually begins in the middle of that seven-year period, the last three and a half years. But during this 70 70th week of Daniel, the seven-year period, the church is gone. The body of Christ is raptured. There'll be an apostate church here going through this hell. But many, many, many Jews are going to be saved, and it'll be Jewish people predominantly that are repopulating the earth during this time. That's what we're talking about there. That uh, those who come to faith and survive that 70th week of Daniel will populate the earth. The saints raptured in the pre-tribulation will reign with Christ over the millennium. Now, isn't it wonderful we get to reign with our Christ? We'll have our spiritual bodies. We won't have a physical body. We won't be procreating. But, but those who survived the tribulation and came through the tribulation as believers, they're going to be repopulating the earth. And most of the earth will be involved in what kind of an activity? How will they support themselves? Agriculture. Agriculture. Beautiful, lush gardens. And, and people just enjoying working the land again. Not all this urban... Boy, oh boy, I'm telling you, they're putting a development or a house or a... An apartment complex in every square yeah. mile of land, aren't they? Oh, it's crazy. What do they regard to the kingdom? The kingdom's literal. It's a literal, physical kingdom on earth for a thousand years, anticipated by both Old Testament and New Testament scriptures and the prophets. The raptured saints are taken out of the earth before the seven-year tribulation or the 70th week of Daniel. And with regard to Israel that the church and Israel are two very distinct people of God with individual redemptive plans. Israel will have a kingdom of God on earth. The church will have the kingdom of heaven in the spiritual realm. And God will complete his redemptive plan for both. Both. Any questions or comments on any of that? Now, what I'm going to be doing uh, when I get back together with you is we'll be going through a lot of what the Bible has to say with what's going to be taking... I'm, I'm going to go to Ezekiel eventually. Eventually, we're going to study through the book of Ezekiel. But during this study on eschatology, let's find out what the Bible really has to say about end times. What's going to be taking place when? Let's look at the steps that God has laid out for us in His Word. And so we'll be doing that next time we get together.